all phytoplankton, including the cyanobacteria, and even including seaweeds and higher plants, throwing them in here, manufacture what I call the most important molecule on Earth. That would be chlorophyll A. Chlorophyll A is the primary light absorbing pigment of photosynthetic organisms. This pigment, it's just a molecule that's able to capture light and in particular it captures particular wavelengths of light as we'll see in just a moment. And it's this molecule's ability to capture light and then take that energy and pass it on that really makes it the most amazing molecule on earth because without it we wouldn't have photosynthesis and without photosynthesis we wouldn't have plants and without plants we wouldn't have anything to eat and so since I like to eat and I'm sure you like to eat we're happy that plants have this particular molecule. Some of these organisms also uh, produce other kinds of chlorophylls and it's really these other kinds of chlorophylls that that really make up the classification system and make up the differences between different kinds of phytoplankton as well as different kinds of higher plants. Some produce chlorophyll B, primarily the green algae and the higher plants. So the sea lettuce we just looked at and the tree outside your house they have chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. The diatoms and dinoflagellates we just talked about as well as coccolithophorids and the kelps that you, we find offshore here in California, they have chlorophyll C along with chlorophyll A. And cyanobacteria as well as red algae have a chlorophyll called D. So we have chlorophyll A, B, C, and D. Now, I really only want you to remember and think about chlorophyll A, and you can kind of lump all the chlorophylls together, but I want you to be aware of these other kinds of chlorophylls because they do distinguish different kinds of organisms. They distinguish the green algae from diatoms and dinoflagellates, and also because these chlorophylls kind of act as helper pigments. They absorb different wavelengths of light or wavelengths of light in different energy bands or different colors as we talked about when we talked about light, uh, colors of light in chapter 7. So these chlorophylls can be produced uh, in response to changing light conditions, in particular in response to changing of the color of the light as it goes, as light penetrates the water column. And so these become important ecologically as well as, again, in the productivity of the ocean, these sort of helper chlorophylls. Okay, let's take a look at a figure from the book that emphasizes this point. This is what's called an absorption spectrum. It indicates on the y-axis here the amount of absorption, relatively speaking, so as we go higher we're getting more absorption. And down here you see wavelengths of light from 400 to 700 nanometers. Now you should remember or you should recall from our discussion of the electromagnetic spectrum that 400 to 700 nanometers are the wavelengths of visible light. In fact, it was at that time that I said, you should remember this, 400 to 700 nanometers. Well, this is why. As you can see here, if we track chlorophyll A, which is indicated by this solid line, and again, you can find this in your book, figure 13.7, we can see that chlorophyll A absorbs in this blue part of the spectrum here, as well as in the red part of the spectrum here. In fact, chlorophyll absorbs, at least in solution, at about 435 nanometers. Now, in the organism, chlorophyll shifts over a little bit and might be in the 440 and maybe even in towards the 450 range. Uh, there's a difference when a molecule is in solution when we extract it out of solution and put it through an absorption, uh, make an absorption spectrum using a, spectra a spectrophotometer, and a difference then when the organism is alive, but those are just fine scientific details. But in any case, uh, par partly warning you because you might see a different number here. But what's significant about this number is that that wavelength is the color of light that's most available in the ocean. Recall back from uh, chapter 7, we talked about why the ocean is blue. Well, it's blue because water absorbs blue light the least. And the wavelength of blue light that water absorbs the least happens to be 435, 440 nanometers. How smart these plants are to tune their photosynthetic apparatus to absorb the, the light color that's the most available. It's one of the miracles of evolution. Okay. 
We can also see if we look at some other pigments like chlorophyll B in this dotted figure here that chlorophyll, other chlorophylls absorb in other wavelengths. Chlorophyll B absorbs maximally at about 480 nanometers. And other kinds of pigments, namely a group of pigments called carotenoids, which you find in carrots, absorb in other wave bands. So what we're building here is by using different pigments, chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B, carotenoids, and the chlorophyll C's and D's, and some other kinds of pigments, organisms can produce those pigments in response to the changing colors of light. Now remember, red and orange disappear immediately or very quickly in the upper ocean. And then your greens and yellows are next, and then finally just your blue. But for organisms living near the surface or living at particular depths where only green light is available, or maybe living beneath a canopy of dense chlorophyll, so when that happens, then sometimes only green light is available. So whatever color of light happens to be available in the ocean, phytoplankton can tune their photosynthetic apparatus by creating or manufacturing other pigments that absorb other wavelengths. I find that extraordinary. All right. We also have a group of pigments called accessory pigments, what I call helper pigments, and these are the non-chlorophyll pigments that also help organism, help phytoplankton absorb light. They also, these helper pigments, also protect phytoplankton. So just like you put on sunglasses or a UV block, phytoplankton can also produce pigments that are the equivalent of, you know, copper tone sunscreen 50 or whatever it is that you happen to use um, that protect the plants from getting too much light because if you've ever taken a shade plant like a fern or something and put it out in the sun well that kills it immediately because they're not adapted for that high light so low light phytoplankton will oftentimes manufacture pigments that protect them uh, under those high light conditions so these accessory pigments um, are important really just to serve as helper pigments for either gathering more light or protecting the photosynthetic apparatus from being destroyed um, by too intense of sunlight. It's also really these accessory pigments and, and probably the main reason that I really bother you with the details of accessory pigments here because that's what gives tides that are caused by blooms of phytoplankton their color. For example, a red Tide. Well, that red color comes from the paradinins in the dinoflagellates. We also have brown tides, and those brown tides, in cases where they happen to be blooms of phytoplankton versus sewage being dumped out into the ocean, but when we have that kind of phenomenon, then it's the fucoxanthins, the brown colors in the diatoms that are creating that color that you perceive when you look out at the ocean, when these organisms are very abundant in the ocean. Let's take another look at some diatoms. This is just to give you an example of the fucoxanthins or the brown colors in diatoms. And this is really an extraordinary photograph. And this person at www.microscopy.uk.org, um, I would check out, urge you to check out, or suggest you check out his website. This guy actually moves these little diatoms into place and creates artwork out of them. And really, you know, maybe I'm a nut about this because I spent so many years counting phytoplankton underneath a microscope, but they really are beautiful organisms. Look at all these little intricate holes and these little what look like spokes of a wheel. Um, they really are gorgeous organisms, microscopic organisms, and these cell walls, these frush jewels as they're called that are created, um, are really ornate and beautiful. Well, these colors that you see here, these brown colors, are primarily fucoxanthins, um, the accessory pigment that helps diatoms photosynthesize. The greens, of course, are the chlorophylls. We see a similar thing when we look at red tides. These are blooms of dinoflagellates, and because dinoflagellates, shown here, an electron microscope picture down in the corner here, because these dinoflagellates have paradinins, a red pigment, when they bloom in perfusion, they make the water look this sort of milky red. It's really an extraordinary color. This is an aircraft flying over uh, Scripps Pier in La Jolla showing a red tide that occurred several years ago in off the coast of California. But